Of course, you all know that one of the big new, um, big new features with the last release of Debian Sarge was a new installation system called Debian Installer. And well, if you have some guys who are pretty much involved in the development of the, those nice stuff and who will tell us a little bit. So please welcome Joey Hess and his dancing apes. <laughs> Um, we, ha we have 45 minutes to do a talk. We're going to talk about the uh, past, present, future of DI and how you can help with it. And we do have four people giving the talk, so wish us luck. Um, I'd like to introduce everybody who's up here. We're going to start off with Holger, who has contributed to DI on the manual, German localizations, um, other things in that area. Um, he's been working in DI for a couple of years, and he's going to talk about the uh, just general overview of DI. Um, then we have Christian, who is basically our um, internationalization coordinator. Um, he basically gets lots of people to translate DI and does it really well, and he's going to talk about that. Over here we have Franz Pop, who's, um, who's mostly been involved in working on the manual builds, that kind of thing, and is now taking over as a DI release manager. Um, and he's going to talk about mostly the manual, and then I'll wrap up with future items and questions, and we'd like you to hold your questions to the end if you could, in case, so in case we don't run out of time. Um, so that's about it. I just wanted to um, ask anyone who's in the audience who has contributed to DI as a translator, as a developer, or anything to please raise your hand. Loads of you. Well, I think we should just give you all a big round of applause because DI has made Debian great. Okay. I'll hand things over to Holger now. And sorry about that. Huh? Microphone working. Hello. 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 Oh yeah, now it's working. Yeah, I'll start with the retrospect of the boot floppies. Um, <laughs> as far as I remember, I've always used boot floppies to install Debian, and it really always worked. It was the partitioner was not so easy to use, but after some years, you got really used to it. Um, the problem with boot floppies was that they were not maintained anymore um, since the end of the 90s. Nobody w wanted to work on them. Um, and for Woody, they were really a pain. Um, designed for i386, there was no hardware detection. Localization was not really well included. It was made for Woody, but yeah, it sucked. And... Um, yeah, it's, they were designed for floppies, and so CD or Netboot was also hacked into it. Um, and a gra graphical installer was also not really possible with boot floppies. Um, DI, um, the design is mo based on DebConf mostly, um, which has, um, which makes different front ends very easily, <coughs> so we can have a graphical installer in Edge with, um, yeah, we'll have it. Um, also, it's easy to translate, so internationalization and localization, um, as you already know, um, is, is part of DI. And also, DebConf gives preceding, so it can be used for various grades of automat 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 automa automation. <laughs> Automatic. <laughs> and <coughs> with UDEPS, um, DI is also modular. So um, the DI team does not work on the whole installer, but there are different people working on different parts of DI. Um, UDEPS are basically Debian packages, but they are smaller so that they fit into RAM disk and they don't have to comply with policy that's also because of the size constraint. Um, another um, design aspect that was used is the main menu, which is normally hidden from the user in the basic install. Um, in cases of errors, the menu pops up, and you can redo steps or do other steps like um, enabling SSH for network console or other things. Um, 
the, the ULETs have one special control header, um, which is read by main menu and defines <coughs> the order um, by which those functionalities are pasted or put into main menu. Um, yeah, and this is basically it. So those are the most important parts of the design. There are other parts like the partitioner, um, but those can be exchanged for another <coughs> partitioner. This is basically what DI is based on. Um, yeah, as you know, DI is teamwork. There are different people working on different ar areas. Um, there is no real leadership, no formal leadership, but there is, um, of course, Joey does very much, is very much involved in everything, so it's very wise to get his advice, or that's not only his advice, but we discuss things on a mailing list or on IRC channel or in real life meetings. Um, yeah, <coughs> for the code, we use the subversion repository on alias. The commit messages go on the mailing list and on the IRC channel, so you can see in real time if, if somebody commits something if you're on IRC. There's a trunk for new development. Um, experimental stuff is done in people branches, and there's the search branch for maintenance now. During the release, there were also release branches which were uh, used to um, to branch the development from the trunk, basically. <laughs> yeah. This is how the development process is. And now Christian will get into some details of localization. Uh, you hear me? Is that fine? OK, thank you. So it's again about localization and internationalization. Sorry of this. So. What are the drawing IDs of DI localization? Well, the first one, okay. Uh, so, before all the English people come around and just kill me, what is this ID about? This is about all display text have to be translated. This is the main ID behind English sucks. Actually, in DI, English does not suck. It is very well written, very well reviewed by many people to be of the best quality possible. And of course, the translation also. Other drawing IDs, Olga said, we are based on DEPCON for all our interface. So everything and every translation goes to DEPCON and especially for the use of get text in PODEPConf by using the PODEPConf, the wonderful PODEPConf system introduced by Denis Barbier over there just after the release of Woody. All translatable material go to DEPCONF templates. There are some enhancements to DEPCONF in C DEPCONF to handle this, and uh, there are some text. Um, templates, which are not very used in your packages, but are used in DI. So everything is in DEPCONF. So, first of all, what is about in localization? This is what we covered with potato. Okay? <laughs> Get the picture? <laughs> Only English. This was Woody. Pretty bit. Yeah, pretty nice improvement. This is what we have in Sarge. And hopefully, this is what we will have in Edge. Not a, not a big part, but I haven't seen you the small part on in Asia. Yes, we expect to cover India, actually. So let me do it once again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> World domination. <laughs> and actually, I'm just doing Excuse me, I'm doing a commit because I have an urgency. I'm just committing 10 more languages in the DI uh, repository, and we will add Vietnamese, Malagasy, Hindi, Macedonian, Tagalog, Belarusian, Punjabi, Esperanto, Wolof, Kosa, and Estonian. That's the point. Kosa thanks to the Ubuntu people 
Thank you, Mark, for giving the causal translation. There seems to be a question over there, but. No, I'm just wondering, for some things that aren't covered, is that for a technical reason or is that a translation reason? That's basically a. <coughs> Right. Yeah. yeah, the question was about <coughs> why are some countries not covered? Well, this is mostly to get you a picture. Many of these countries actually have either English or French, especially in Africa, as official language. But I don't consider this country covered because their main language is not covered. This is also special for India because there are so many languages. There are like uh, 20 languages over India. So I just put... India in red because I expect these 20 languages to enter. Okay. So. Sorry, uh, Christian? Yeah. I, I just thought uh, that you might want to uh, add another red space to your slide there. You might be getting uh, a. Um, you might be getting some correspondence from somebody who wants to do Mongolian. <coughs> the uh, old script of Mongolian. Oh, yes, probably, yes. You, you're puzzling me a little bit, actually. So d don't be too nitpicking these white spaces in this, uh, in this uh, world map, actually, please. OK. <coughs> so how would do we proceed? We have the concept of levels. So we go f levels from uh, DI translation down to world domination. OK. So first of all, what we call core DI package. This is what we call DI. Actually, this is all what happens before the first reboot. The second level is called level two, of course. Uh, this is the default base system install, when you only install the base package. Everything that, you are, that is used to input users has to be translated, only input users, <coughs> not displayed text. Level three is any kind of base system install. Any user prompting has to be translated. Level four is all DI is translated for base system install. You don't see any word of English except the kernel messages. Hopefully someday. <laughs> anyway. And we will soon add a few more levels up to world domination. Probably level five will be the default de desktop installs, all the prompting of x.org, probably, and a few more things. Level six is translating every depth templates all over standard packages. And level seven is world domination. Of course, everything is Debian is translate. <laughs> so I got seven points. <laughs> Oh, it was more like kidding, including me kernel messages. I think it's a bit hard work. But you know, Windows speak French to me. So we should do it. OK, what's the future except translating the kernel? We, of course, need to add new languages. I just added 11, of tra uh, 11 trans uh, languages. Sorry. Some very small languages, very few spoken, and some quite wide spoken, such as Hindi. We need for this more locales for people who attended Dennis' talk just a few minutes ago, which is not easy to do. We need probably for this to have an easier to use framework, because most of the new translators are not very skilled to our SVN commit and so on and so on. So we need very simple framework. So I put a little thoughts, but they are already, ideas are not very clear on that matter, in my mind at least. But it's not always clear in my mind. New languages, we need a graphical installer. This is probably the main point in localization. For the world combining languages, we talked a lot with Jalda about the support for Hindi and all other languages from India. They are very tricky to, to support. We need to stop depending on Unicode text mode fonts, the one we show at, because a lot of characters are missing there. We need better right to left and bi bidirectional languages display. Actually, we made a big progress during DevConf because now Hebrew is right aligned. And before we had Hebrew right to left, but left aligned, which was silly. And of course, we need to final to universe domination <laughs> and support Klingon. <laughs> uh, 
and I think I handled the plans for the installation guide. Thank you, Christian. So let me start off by asking a few questions. Who has actually done installations using DI? <laughs> well, that's most people. And who has used the installation manual while he was doing that? A while. while or before or whatever? <laughs> well, quite a few people, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely a minority and that's part of the problem with the manual I think so these are the uh, the, the areas I will cover uh, during this part of the talk for technical aspects I've covered some of them in the paper so if you're interested in how uh, the installer is written how it's uh, built uh, how it's translated then please uh, read the paper and visit the website, uh, men, uh, the manual website pages because there's some more information there. The basic thing about um, how the manual is written is that there is only one source for all architectures and there's a heavy use of conditions that makes some paragraphs appear in the build for one architecture and not in the build for other architectures. This makes it fairly hard to work on the manual because you have to keep all those relationships in mind and you will be confused by text that concerns an architecture that you may have no knowledge of. <coughs> the manual is av available in four formats. Uh, mainly published uh, in HTML and is available from several sources. The official website has the current manual for the Sarge uh, release and that is still being updated. So if you're looking for the latest version of the manual, please don't use the ones included on the CDs, but go to the official website. <coughs> There's also a package Debian installer manual, but that has the same drawbacks <coughs> that was built at the time of RC3, uh, release candidate uh, of, of DI, and so is somewhat outdated. The development version of the manual has recently been updated so that it now reflects the edge version of the installer, and that's between quotes because well, we may backport some of the new developments that are in there at uh, point releases for Sarge. So then they will, of course, go into the Sarge version of the manual. <coughs> so here's the status of the manual. And as you can see, it's still largely based on the manual for Woody. And as that was made on boot floppy, or based on boot floppies, and there's a really big change from boot floppies to DI, that's not a good thing. It's also not very well bala balanced. There are a few areas that are covered fairly in depth, like how to set up a, uh, a netboot server, a server for netbooting, uh, while other areas, like the, the details, the more specific stuff you can do with the DI, like details of preceding, are not covered at all, except by means of an example file, but it's not like written out uh, what your options are and where th stuff starts to happen if, if you do it a certain way. The big black border <coughs> is there for, uh, for a good reason. Um, for a number of architectures that are listed, uh, the manual includes this warning. And that's because, well, since Woody, it has not really been checked for that architecture. So the, the information in there may not be accurate. And what we really need is people involved in ports to care about the manual for their port. 
and help us to check the manual against actual installations, tell us what's wrong there, and uh, if at all possible, help, help by submitting patches to the manual. And I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm of course willing to help you find your way around the XML source, uh, or even if you don't want to bother with that, uh, take the HTML page, page uh, copy stuff of that, uh, change it, submit the change text, and I will worry about how to get it into the XML source. That's, that's no problem, but we really need help in that area. So, for translations, originally uh, we used DocBook XML, and originally the only option translators had was to take an English XML file, copy it, and just translate the text that's in there. And at that time we had seven to 12 languages. Seven languages were uh, fully translated. The others were in various st stages of uh, progression. Last year we made a big improvement by adding support for uh, PO file translation. And that's drastically increased the number of uh, languages that we now have for the manual. It's, uh, we have currently 13 uh, full uh, translations uh, and another six are being worked on. Besides English, you can see which languages are supported. And especially, I, th I think the ori Oriental languages are very well uh, involved here. So, what, are we, what do we want for the future? If possible, more translations. There are also a few languages for which we currently can't build the PDF uh, version of the manual, mainly the Oriental languages, Russian and Greek, uh, or rather everything that really uses a different character set, than, or, or font rather, than uh, letter type, than uh, English and Western languages. Um, I, I really hope that we can get there by also getting more work done together with the DDP project. Um, I've heard that they would like to switch from Debian Doc, which they're currently <laughs> using, to DocBook XML. Uh, well, we are already doing that, so I guess we could learn from each other. And I also hope that, for example, the, the people in the, the Oriental communities can help work out the, the PDF problems, because they must have solved that already probably. And the last thing is that we should think about restructuring or splitting uh, the manual, uh, maybe into a guide for newbies, uh, people installing Debian for the first time, where we cover just the basic flow of an installation, uh, and a second guide which goes more in depth into the features of the eye uh, and how you can use it to customize how, uh, for instance, derived distributions can work with it. So your help is very welcome in this area. That's the end of my part. I'll now hand over to Joey. So um, I'd like to finish up the talk by talking a little bit about, about the future of DI and how you can help and get involved if you're interested in doing that. Um, so I thought, first of all, I'd look back a little bit. Um, these are two graphs. Um, the topmost graph is how many people have committed to DI each month in the five years since the project was founded. And the um, red commits or most are just everything that isn't a translation. Green is translation commits. Um, the actually number of people who have who've committed translations each month. So as you can see, we've grown the team quite a bit. Um, over the past, over mostly of this year, it's fallen off a little bit um, as we've tried to settle things down and just get everything stabilized for Sarge. 
Um, you can see on the bottom graph here, this is the actual number of commits each month uh, by translators and by developers. And you can see that we did have some big peaks and things have again settled out there. Um, if you look at these graphs in detail, which I probably shouldn't do, <laughs> um, you can find all kinds of interesting events in here, um, which actually I should probably ask Christian for because I'm forgetting them. <laughs> but um, for example, you can see when we began to um, add lots of translations here, um, you can see a peak, which is I believe this little peak here in 07, 2003 is around um, Debcon the DevConf in Oslo when we really began a lot of work, and then we have several beta releases and so on. But anyway, um, the interesting thing from this graph, from my point of view, is that it definitely was up and to the right, which is a marketing term, I believe, <laughs> um, pretty well until we started stabilizing things out for Sarge. And I think it'd be good if we could pick development back up and really get some energy back in here and start doing lots of cool things again. So, to that end, here is a slide which is very much not Zindi compliant. Um, I believe it has 14 items on it, so I don't expect you to remember it all. Um, but it is just some, a very few of our to-do items. Um, you'll find most of these in the paper. Um, a couple of them have been added during DebConf here just based on feedback from people and things that have been brought to my attention and bumped up the to-do list a little bit to, so you can see them here. So. Um, I don't know if I have time to go over the whole thing, but I'll do a few of them. Um, the topmost one sort of affects Debian as a whole. Um, we would really like to move over to using UTF-8 by default as far as the installed system. DI already uses UTF-8 throughout, but you end up with a Debian system that isn't in UTF-8, which can be a little bit of a problem if your native language does need UTF-8. Um, next two items here, um, DI updates for Sarge and support for installing Sarge using the etch installer are basically two different ways that we could attack the problem of having Sarge out there with a 268 kernel and no newer kernel version and lots of new hardware coming out. Um, we would like to come up with some way to get newer kernel versions available using the Sarge installer. That's probably pretty technically difficult, um, but we at least need to do it for security fixes. Um, as far as supporting installing Sarge using the Etch installer, that's something that we expect will happen and we'll just continue to support the installing Sarge throughout the lifetime of the installer, hopefully. Um, the Sarge installer actually supports installing Woody to some extent due to the works of school Linux who actually use it to install Woody, so it shouldn't be a big deal. Um, next one is a big one, of course, the graphical installer. Um, we do have a graphical installer, but very few people have actually managed to build it and get it to work. Um, and we need to do a lot of work in that area, and once we get it working, a lot of work on polishing it and making it nice and actually taking advantage of everything you can do with a GUI. And I do think that's an important thing because it'll pull in a lot of new users who may be a little bit th scared by the current text mode interface, even though most people do find it fairly easy to use. Um, also, um, well, um, the next one, improving automated installation. We do have a fairly good automated installation of Debian already using the installer, but there are some little areas which make it sort of difficult. Um, the fact that you have to pass a whole lot of kernel command line parameters when you're booting just to get it up to the point where you can automate the rest of the install can be a big problem. It makes it really hard for people who aren't intimately familiar with that stuff to get it working. And I'd love it if we could just have some very simple documentation that walks you through every step of setting up an automated install so you can have, a, uh, have your own CD image that automatically installs Debian exactly how you like it or you can have your network like we have here, netboot DI, as soon as somebody plugs their machine in, it'd be great. And so that's an area you wanna work on. Um, one of the ideas along those lines is to use DHCP for sending all the, um, all the pre-seed information across the wire. There's some other ideas which, which could be worked on there. Next one is one that I threw in for the fun of it, encrypted file system support, I think it'd be great if you could just pop, just boot up DI and install your system with encrypted root file system on your laptop. And I don't know why nobody has worked on this yet, but as far as I know, nobody is. And I think it would be a wonderful thing, and our partitioner was actually designed with this as a specific feature in mind from the very beginning. So <laughs> I'd love it if somebody out there did that. Um, another area where we need some work still 
is in hardware detection. Um, some of the big problems that we know about are the serial ATA drives pretty much, you know, they work sometimes. A lot of the hardware doesn't work. Apparently, some of them that should work as far as the kernel support don't real, still don't work in DI. We need somebody, or quite a few people probably, to figure out in individual cases why these drives don't work and get back to us with all the details of what we need to just load the modules up in the right order or whatever so they work, which should be pretty simple if you actually have a SATA drive that doesn't work. I'd really encourage you to pound on it until it does. Um, other issues as far as hardware detection are currently we're using Discover in DI. We're thinking about using Hot Plug. We're thinking about moving to Discover 2. Haven't really decided what to do there. Um, but we probably can't stick with Discover 1 forever. And Hot Plug and UDEV sort of go hand in hand. And we're probably going to have to move to UDEV pretty soon because they're dropping DevFS out of the kernel. They don't think anybody uses it. <laughs> um, another issue in hardware detection is that if you have two network cards right now, it's fairly common that you'll install and get one of them as F1 during the install. And then after you reboot, that will be um, we get it as F0 doing the install, and after you reboot, it will be F1, which completely screws up the rest of the install, of course. Um, that's really fairly difficult to solve completely just by loading the modules in the right order because it's basically just an ordering issue. Which whichever order you load the modules, and you have to make DI and Debian exactly the same. So an alternative is to use um, Ethernet device naming so that it doesn't really matter if it comes up as S1 or S0 because you've given it a nice sane name, um, which is something I'd love to see rolled into DI. I think that Ubuntu already has code in this area, and we just haven't gotten around to doing it. And it's also, to some extent, this like UTF-8 support is something that Debian has to decide they want to do. It's not something that DI can just foist on Debian. So a lot of these issues you know, come down to what Debian wants, too. Um, Next one is another good example of that because we are in the process of splitting out non-free firmware and drivers from the kernel, and that means that DI is going to have to deal with it somehow. And probably requiring that users load it from a floppy or something isn't going to make a lot of people happy. So we have to come up with better ways to deal with that. Um, we've already done a little bit of work with using a NIT RAMFS which lets you basically append the modules to the end of your DI boot image. But we haven't figured out what to do about CD installs, and all this is still fairly you know, up in the air. We haven't figured it out. Um, so the next issue here is an issue which I don't know if anybody in the room could help with, but I we would dearly love some help from people who can help us support people who are blind using the installer. Right now, we do support it, but only if you install from floppies which is pretty weird. <laughs> um, another one which, since I'm in Europe, I thought I'd mention is installs from PPPoE. Seems to be pretty big over here. There's even still some people here who use ISDN, and we occasionally get requests for that. And that's definitely possible to add to the installer at this point. It's a simple matter of coding, and it's probably not even that hard. We already have all the modules there. We even have PPP in the installer if you need it. You just need a little, a little bit of glue code to make it all work. Um, so let's see. Yeah, the next one I, I think I'll skip for right now because it's something that's just my pet peeve, but when after that, disk space checking for tasks it would be really nice if when you uh, went to install a desktop task, you didn't download a gigabyte of data, unpack it all, and run out of disk space in the middle. So if someone would like to work with me to develop a patch for that, that'd be great. I haven't quite figured out how to figure out how much disk space a task uses at runtime without being excessively slow or ugly or something. So I'd really appreci appreciate some help there. Um, next one, there's a lot of work that we could still do to make it easier to customize the installer, to let people put their own kernel into it, and that kind of thing. We need more documentation along those lines and so on. So, and the final one, which is I think probably the most, one of the most important things we can do right now is just find a way to find a single question during the install and make most people not see it. And repeat. <laughs> Until done. <laughs> um, so that's my enormous checklist of a few to-do items. <laughs> and I think I'll open it up for questions now. Um, so questions from anybody here? And I thought I'd also mention 
that we're going to have a meeting today at 7. It's over in the glass-walled room. Um, and everybody's welcome to attend, especially people who have already worked on DI, but anybody who's interested or would like to help or whatever, welcome to come. So questions? Anyone? Jodar. Uh, Jerry, uh, yesterday I heard that uh, Ubuntu is also working on a graphical installer. Are they working with the Debian team, or this is a separate project of their own? I actually haven't heard much about Ubuntu's plans for a graphical installer, but it looks like Mark's going to tell us all about it. So. <laughs> Colin continues to hack. I think he did the GTK stuff for DI. That's um, right, he did do that. But, but we're mostly likely to sort of do a copy from live CD thing like Nopix. So we'd have two, two ways to install graphically effectively, either the industrial strength DI one, which would let you configure it in, in more detail, or the kind of copy from live CD approach. And you're going to use DI for the copy from live CD approach or something still, sort of. <laughs> OK, so their live CD uses DI, he said. Got a question? Yeah, if I've seen about what, what, which areas of Debian you've talked about, I think it really touched most of the areas of Debian. So have you had the feeling that the Debian installer was something like a push in many areas of Debian to bring new things in, or did it just rather take things that existed and integrate in this installer? And how is your relation to, for example, package maintainers of a DHC client or something mm -hmm. like that? Well, you know, one of the things about DI is that it's sort of like a little miniature Linux distribution based on its own package format. And, and all that, but the fact of the matter is that all these little packages are maintained by people in Debian. Our DHCP client UDEB is maintained by the same people who maintain your DHCP, your DHCP DEB. And so we do have fairly tight lines of communication there. Of course, there is a lot of work that we've done to push changes into Debian that make it easier to install. You know, things like people just have to use DebConf now, and you know, we had to go, sure, go through and make sure that was true. And as far as things like UTF-8 support, you know, we have to we have to you know let Debian know that it's a problem. The installer has to fall back to non tf at the end, and so I think there's an ongoing process there of just communicating ideas back and getting the getting things from Debian as soon as they become available. Of course, you know we work closely with a lot of different areas of Debian at this point. I hope that answered it. Um, um, next question. Oh. Yeah, I was curious about uh, what you guys are thinking about how you're going to go about doing graphical installer because I know some of the issues with doing that and why it hasn't been done so far is because it's very architecture independent, uh, arch architecture dependent, and uh, I suppose uh, like you can't use the uh, the Piggy installer from Progeny because it's I386 specific. But if there was some uh, initial architecture detection at the very beginning to figure out if you can use that. Would you use something like that? Or w what are your thoughts for dealing with that? OK. Um, as I understand it, the current graphical installers that exist is a GTK front end for CDEBConf, which then runs on top of either X or a GTK frame buffer interface. And we haven't quite settled on which of those to run it on, because that's one of the harder parts of the problem, of course, just to get a display up there. Um, as far as hardware detection for getting the graphical installer going it's, and ripping something out of Piggy or something like that, we found it's really hard to take very much from another installer. We can definitely take ideas and we can take you know, small pieces of code, but it's, it's just the way these things work. It's very hard to take larger chunks, unfortunately, uh, which is actually something that DI aims to solve to some extent. Um, so I hope that answered I also wanted to remind everybody that we do have three other people here who could have specific questions addressed to them if necessary, or if you all have anything that you'd like to add to any of my answers, please. <laughs> okay, so who's next? Okay, Sapphire. <laughs> Let's try to get one over there next time. <laughs> Hello, my name is Safi Shicerovic. I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I work as a DI translator. I just have one question um, regarding uh, the, the development of DI, uh, that is uh, the speed of the de development. Uh, I know that we have uh, had the problem so far in, uh, in uh, relation to kernels in DI. I mean in uh, relation to updating kernels, especially 2.6 ones, uh, to a new revision. That's why we have 2.68 in Sarge and not uh, some more recent kernel. Uh, it's because it was very hard for us to keep up with uh, security updates and supports 
uh, with kernels in Sarge, and uh, likewise uh, the uh, other kernels which are in the archive. I'm just wondering if uh, there are any changes being made now or are planned for the future so that we can avoid such a mess because we have so many uh, kernel packages. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Um, part of the answer to that is that we've already started work to address the issues that made it very hard to update to new kernels toward the end of the Sarge release process. And we were working with the kernel team pretty closely because they're very interested in this question too, of course. Um, I, I, I do think it's important to note that this was the first time that we did it and we've learned a lot and we were very cautious about some areas as far as getting DI out there for Sarge. So, for example, the, I believe that the kernel team still intends to upgrade to upload 2.6.12 today, and I, I intend to, uh, to update DI to that within like half an hour of their upload. It's so already as soon as they give me a dip. So um, I do think we can improve. <laughs> I think that we're going to. Okay. Um, anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Uh. That we uh, also need to have a period of testing when a new kernel is implemented in the installer because uh, it will break for people who have previously had successful installs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, one question I guess mostly for Franz. Um, about the documentation, I've heard about preceding for a long time. I've sometimes read that blog entries about preceding. I have yet to find documentation about preceding. Um, how do I get preceding done? Is there any basic documentation to get me started, or do you need help on further documenting it? What is the current status? Uh, well, there is basic documentation. There is a, a section in the manual about preceding, and there is uh, an appendix that has an example precede file. Uh, and you can take a lot of tips from that on how to get started. The problem is that the more advanced features of preceding are not documented there, uh, like if you use the early command or the late, late command, where exactly does that, uh, does that command happen? You really need to test it out a bit. And also for some questions, you will just need to get into the code or get into the, the depth database uh, uh, to see what values are being used and such. There's no full list of, of values that can be preceded, but I, think, I don't think that's going to happen anyway because it, there's just too many options. But a little bit more documentation about the uh, possibilities you have with preceding would be very good to have, yes. Uh, on, on that subject, uh, I've got a, an example, a worked example of preceding which makes it fairly easy to get up and running pretty much instantaneously with how-tos on how to set up your media for CDs, uh, USB sticks, and PXE booting. And it's at uh, hams.com slash D, D minus I. Uh, I'm quite happy to move that into the manual, and uh, I'd really like to get some features. So I'd, there are a, few, a couple of features. I'm doing it against the Sarge Debian installer at the moment, and I was trying, so I've got a few nasty hacks that, to patch into the uh, the image because I was trying to use a stable base to build my stuff on rather than building it on a moving platform. Um, so if people want to have a look at that, uh, I'm perfectly happy to take recipes from people and add that into there or have a, a central repository for for recipes that we put into the main uh, subversion. But I think it would be really nice to be able to get it down so that you've only got one or two parameters on the, the boot line will make it into a pre-seed and say, I want that sort of a machine and get you there. So uh, that was my vision and I'll uh, hopefully try and get that into the, the main uh, subversion fairly soon. Uh, there are a couple of features that I need to work on and I've been utterly useless at getting anything to boot because uh, I haven't got a spare machine here <laughs> this week. So as soon as I get that sorted out, I'll, uh, I'll work on that. Uh, the, related to that, I was wondering what criteria you're going to use for backporting features into the Sarge. So that was uh, hands.com slash d minus i. And it's got a, it's a readme and a few how-tos and it loads of spelling mistakes, I imagine. Okay. Let me just say that I think it's great that 
that Phil's here pimping his pre-seed files, and I want to see more of that. And I do think we should work to get it all, um, you know, merge, get the documentation merged back in and so on. That's great. Yeah. You asked about um, backporting stuff into Sarge. Um, our criteria right now are fairly strict, but I think that we do have the potential to make another another point release of Sarge with a new version of DI, and we just have to work it out with the stable release manager and all that. So it's still sort of up in the air at this point. Um, so I think that I should probably stop now. Do we have time for one more? No? Not really. Just to information, I think there's something about in the Debian wiki. Sorry? I think the Debian wiki has ah. information on preceding. There, that's true. There is information about preceding on the wiki. There is some more there. Um, well, I don't, okay, since we don't have much more time, I'd like to thank you all and remind you that we do have a meeting today at 7. So if you have more questions, come there. Thank you.